As part of our ongoing discussion about the pistol brace rule by the ATF, I want to point out how I think the Second Amendment is going to save the day when it comes to legal challenges against the ATF's rules involving stabilizing braces. And it's going to save the day in a way that may not be obvious right now, but will become obvious down the road. Let me explain the geeky nature of my theory and how I think this is going to play out going forward. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gunner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and New York Times best-selling author. If you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so. We're trying really hard to get to 100,000 subscribers. We think that'll make a big difference with the social media algorithms. All right, so we all know we've been reading about and talking about the recent ATF regulation dealing with stabilizing braces which basically is a 293-page explanation of how one can take a handgun, add something onto the back of it, and convert it into a short-barrel rifle, supposedly requiring registration under the National Firearm Act. Well, I want to talk generally about a few ideas here of why I don't think this is going to work. I have many reasons, by the way, why I don't think this is going to work for the ATF. But I'm only going to do this in a little bit here and there. Okay, I don't want to put it all together in one place. It'll, it would go on for hours. So I'm going to break this down a little bit here, a little bit there, depending on the video. So today I want to explain how I think the Second Amendment, specifically the existence of a legitimate Second Amendment challenge, is going to cause courts, in my view, to strike down the ATF p p pistol braces rules based on administrative law. You heard me right. I think that the existence of a Second Amendment is going to actually cause courts to strike down the pistol brace rule on administrative law or for administrative law reasons. Hear me out. At a most basic level, there's going to be two general challenges to the pistol brace rule in court. And I'm going to speak very generally here. Okay, there's countless reasons why I think this is illegal, but we're going to keep it general, uh, just talk about two general things. The first one is what I call the Administrative Procedural Act or Administrative Arguments or Statutory Overreach Arguments, things like this. Specifically, what I mean by that is that under basic federal law, you all know the rules. The Congress passes statutes, which means they pass the law, the statutory law, it's up to the executive branch, the president, to enforce those laws and the courts, our third branch of government, to interpret those laws. What we have here, as I see with the ATF enacting their 293-page expansion of the definition of rifle, is really an expansion and amendment to federal statutory law. But the ATF is not Congress. The ATF is not in the legislative branch. The ATF is part of the executive branch, which means they are beholden to the President of the United States, and they are there to enforce the law, but they're not there to make the law up. Which, as I see it, if you write 293 pages trying to expand on the definition of rifle, you are making the law up, which is not your job. That is Congress's job. And the courts, I think, will completely agree with me. Just for two examples of this in the last 12 months or so, the United States Supreme Court in West Virginia versus the EPA specifically said that we're dealing with major questions. The EPA did not have the authority to make up the law. It had to get authority from Congress before, for example, it could regulate greenhouse gases. That's West Virginia versus EPA. And then more recently, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals down in Texas, the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, came out and said that in context of the bump stock litigation, it was illegal and it was totally illegal and unconstitutional for the ATF to redefine bump stocks, a piece of plastic, as somehow constituting a machine gun. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals said in the Cargill case, that's absurd. Clearly you don't have the authority, ATF, to expand the definition of machine gun as found in the National Firearms Act, a statute, to include bump stocks. That requires an act of Congress. And there is no act of Congress and you can't do it. That Cargill case I've been predicting is the one that's going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court, and that is the vehicle by which the U.S. Supreme Court will spank the ATF badly. That's my prediction. Watch for that in the 2023-2024 term. Mark my words, I think that's going to happen, and it's going to be exciting and favorable to us. 
Now, let's go back to this pistol brace stabilizing brace controversy. All right, it's not that hard. Give me a few minutes. It's not that hard to understand, but I do want to break it down for you. There will be these administrative law challenges like we saw in EPA versus West Virginia and the bump stock case. These administrative challenges will basically be arguing in one form or another that the ATF lacks the authority to redefine rifle or to expand the definition of rifle. And I think that's a very powerful, powerful argument for several reasons. The first is, of course, that uh, they are clearly expanding the number of so-called rifles in America uh, that would be short barrel rifles by virtue of their definition. Basically saying if you have a pistol handgun, you attach something onto the end of it, that becomes a short barrel rifle. And uh, we just, that's because that's what we think. We have this very complicated, you know, series of factors that must be considered. There's like a three part test for part one. And then part two, we have a six factor test and we are not going to tell you, meaning we, the ATF, are not going to tell you what combination of those six factors allow you to meet the second part of what would be a, a short barrel rifle definition in the event that you put a stabilizing brace on the back of your pistol. So all that's going to be very complicated, but either, no matter how you see it, as I see it, it is expanding the definition of rifle. It certainly expands the definition of short barrel rifle beyond what the ATF originally said uh, existed back in 2012 when it started issuing these letters saying that stabilizing braces when added to pistols did not give rise to short barrel rifles. Uh, there's going to be a lot of explaining that's going to have to be done there. But again, either way, ATF has expanded the definition of rifle. They're not allowed to do it because that's up to Congress to make the law, not the ATF, number one. Uh, number two, and this is more of a technical argument, but it's a very powerful argument, and I think it may be the winning argument. And here's the argument. Under the National Firearms Act, there's two ways that one can get permission, if you will, from the federal government to do something with NFA weapons, NFA items. The two things or, or activities that one can undertake where you need to get permission from the government uh, is, number one, if you want to make an NFA item, if you want to make one, you have to get permission from the ATF, from the Department of Justice, to do that, to make one. The second is if you want to transfer it. So if I own a machine gun uh, that I've owned, let's say I've owned a machine gun since 1982, before the ban and all that sort of stuff, before the Hughes Amendment, I want to transfer it to you, I have to, you know, obviously get permission to transfer it to someone else. So those are the two things. The NFA allows for uh, permission to make a gun, to make a short barrel rifle, and or to transfer a short barrel rifle. One thing, one thing that the National Firearms Act statute clearly does not permit, clearly does not allow, at least on its face, is the authority for, for the ATF to accept the registration of firearms that should have been registered under the NFA, but were not. Nothing about the National Firearms Act allows the ATF to take in or to allow for after-the-fact registration of short barrel rifles and any other NFA items after they've been made, because that's not in the statute. Now, there was an instance, I believe, in the 1990s where there was a couple shotguns where it was retroactively allowed for shotguns to be registered under the NFA that previously they were not allowed to. But because that involved such a small number of people and a small number of items, no one really cared, paid much attention to it. It kind of occurred and it was fine. This is a far cry from what we're dealing with stabilizing braces, where you're looking at somewhere between 10 million, maybe 40 million. I've seen the number as high as 40 million, but certainly millions upon millions of Americans, you know, had these pistols with stabilizing braces. Uh, and that is a big deal, much bigger than the uh, shotguns of the 1990s that were allowed to be retroactively in, uh, uh, registered with the NFA. Uh, it's not clear. Again, there's no statutory authority for this. I suppose if it were done and no one challenged it, well, maybe that would be okay, but I find it hard to believe no one's going to challenge that because they don't have the statutory authority. So the remedy that the ATF has set forth in their 293 pages, uh, that alone is not even allowed under the statute. So the ATF is an executive branch agency is exceeding their authority under the statute, not just by expanding the definition of rifle, but also by allowing for people to supposedly register their gun with the NFA after the fact, which neither of which I just said would be permitted under the current statutory scheme of, of federal law, meaning the ATF can't do either of the things they're talking about in their 293 uh, pages. The third thing is the rule of lenity. Now, we've talked about this. Very, it's very geeky. It's a criminal law concept, but I'm going to make sure you all understand this. And there's a Supreme Court case called Thompson Center Arms. The Thompson Center Arms talks about the rule of lenity. 
The rule of lenity, as I see it, think about it like a baseball game. You know the old saying, the tie goes to the runner, meaning if you want to throw out a runner, you have to get make sure the baseball gets to the, uh, the first baseman before the runner touches first base. And if the ball gets there at the same time as the runner, the tie goes to the runner and the runner is safe. The rule of lenity works in the same way. If there is ambiguity, if a statute or some question of law is ambiguous, then the tie goes to the private citizen and the government loses. Now, we've talked about the definition of ambiguous and vague. Okay, not that hard. Here's what you got to understand. Something in the law is vague and ambiguous. If the term or the phrase or the statute, whatever it is, contract term, it doesn't matter. If that item is subject to two or more reasonable interpretations, they may even contradict each other. So here, if anyone has actually looked at the factors to be considered before a handgun attached to a stabilizing brace or pistol brace is a, is a short barrel rifle or not, it is pretty clear that that is gonna be subject to multiple interpretations, multiple reasonable arguments as to whether or not something is a short barrel rifle under the NFA or if it's not, which means that given that ambiguity, I do not see sitting here today at least, how the rule of lenity uh, that we learned about in the Thompson Center arms case in front of the Supreme Court, how the rule of lenity uh, does not apply against the ATF and say, look, this is ambiguous, this is vague and ambiguous, the rule of lenity, lenity means that the private citizen wins the day and the government doesn't, massive ambiguity associated with what is a uh, what is a short barrel rifle when it comes to these pistol braces attached to handguns, therefore the rule of lenity is going to, uh, lenity is going to apply, and um, there's no way to enforce it. So I think that's kind of the third thing. This is especially true where the ATF in their 293 pages, and we'll, we'll, we'll read you some of the language in a, in a future video, where the ATF says repeatedly that going all the way back to 2012, they've come out in many instances on the other side saying that if you attach a stabilizing brace to a pistol, it is not a short barrel rifle. So that by definition, dispositively demonstrates, as I see it, that if the ATF itself, as the intellectual gurus of the technology of firearms in America, supposedly, right, if they can't reach a clear, unambiguous conclusion as to whether or not a pistol with a, a brace is a short barrel rifle, nobody else can be expected to do the same. So I think almost by virtue of the ATF's conduct since 2012, it proves dispositively, as I see it, that these, this concept is vague and ambiguous. And because it's clearly vague and ambiguous, the rule of lenity from the Thompson, you know, Thompson Center Arms case applies, and the government simply cannot win a prosecution against any individual over this topic, as I see it. And last but not least is the Staples versus United States case. We've talked about this before that says that for an individual to go to prison when you're dealing with a firearm issue under the National Firearms Act, the individual has to know that the characteristics of the weapon clearly are an NFA item. In the, in the case of Staples versus the United States, Mr. Staples thought he had a semi-automatic rifle. It turns out that when the ATF got possession of this, they were able to make that gun fire fully automatically, which made it a machine gun. And they indicted Mr. Staples. Mr. Staples says, well, maybe a machine gun. I have no idea. I didn't know it was. So you can't put me in jail because I didn't know it. And the Supreme Court agreed with Mr. Staples and said that if the if the ATF, the EOJ, wants to put you in prison for an NFA item involving a firearm, at least, the presumption is that's a lawful firearm because it's you're commonly owned in America. Everyone owns a firearm, really, in America, right? So uh, the only way you can go to jail for a short barrel rifle is if you know it is. At least that's how I apply staples to this, and we've talked about this in other videos. So now, that is the basic arguments on the administrative law as to why I think the ATF's efforts involving these pistol braces are going to fail as a matter of administrative law. But now I'm going to show you, in my view, why the Second Amendment will save the day even though I think the ATF is going to get their butt kicked on the administrative arguments, I'm going to show you how the Second Amendment is going to help us, even though it will not be the official formal reason why the ATF goes down in flames on this pistol brace fight. <clears throat> you see, the second area of challenge is going to be that the law here violates the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. Now, think about this for just a second. This is not rocket science, folks. I know I'm the one that's forced to read all these hundreds of thousands of pages and bring it to you, but at the end of the day, when I explain it to you, 
hopefully it comes across very easy and understandable for all of you. So then you become your own Second Amendment scholars in your own right. Okay. Now, in the United States Supreme Court decision of Heller versus the District of Columbia, you know what that held. That said that handguns are protected arms, as in the right of the people to keep and bear arms, and handguns is included within that, and they are protected arms. You cannot ban handguns, including semi-automatic handguns, because in the Caetano case in 2016, Justice Alito talks about pistols and semi-automatic handguns being protected by the Second Amendment. So now we know semi-automatic handguns are clearly protected by the Heller case and the Caetano case, and in some ways by the Bruin case, because everyone carries handguns. So Bruin implicitly says that handguns are also protected arms, of course, that need Bruin because it's already been found before in prior Supreme Court precedents. Okay, now, so handguns are protected arms under the Second Amendment. We know, though, there's no Supreme Court precedent on point clearly on point yet, meaning undeniably on point yet, it is highly likely that semi-automatic rifles are going to be protected arms under the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. We know, for example, in the district, uh, in the D.C. Court of Appeals case of Heller II, in dissent, Brett Kavanaugh, who at the time was a judge and not a Supreme Court justice, said that semi-automatic rifles no different than semi-automatic handguns, are clearly protected arms because they're commonly used by Americans for lawful purposes. And I think that's pretty clearly the case. And the question is whether or not the lower courts will get that right or if the Supreme Court's going to have to fix that. But I think it's pretty clear that semi-automatic rifles are protected arms. So here you have the shortest types of guns imaginable, handguns, semi-automatic handguns are protected arms under the Second Amendment. You are almost certainly, in my view, going to have semi-automatic rifles are protected arms under the Second Amendment. So you have the long guns are protected on the Second Amendment and the shortest guns are protected on the Second Amendment. And now when it comes to something in between, right? The Goldilocks, the middle, the warm, just the right temperature. Short barrel rifles. Well, short barrel rifles, semi-automatic short barrel rifles, if you think about it, they are basically the mid-range point between protected handguns on the one hand and protected rifles on the other hand. So one wonders just commonsensically, how is it that short barrel rifles, which are essentially long handguns or shortened semi-automatic rifles, both of categories I think are, are protected or will be protected. So why should short barrel rifles not also be protected by the Second Amendment? Moreover, I think that short barrel rifles are likely meet the common use test. But again, we don't need to get into that here and now. I should note that we know the, the, the ATF is scared to death of the common use test, but they know it's coming and they're going to hit them. In, uh, it's going to hit them in the forehead with a, uh, with a two by four as a matter of law, I think, because if you look at the 293 pages, the ATF devotes multiple pages talking about how, in their view, short barrel rifles are, quote, dangerous and unusual. And you know, if you've been watching this channel from the start, Dangerous and unusual is what the government has to prove a particular arm is before it can be banned. And I know there's some nuances there. We don't need to get into on this. The bottom line is the only chance that the government has to ban a weapon in America is by demonstrating, and the burden is on the government, that that weapon is dangerous and unusual. And to the and the flip side is, if Americans can show, the pro t side shows, that weapons are commonly used by Americans for lawful purposes, with 200,000 being the floor, because we know in Caetano, 200,000 stun guns was deemed commonly used by Americans for lawful purposes, and most of the weapons we're talking about dealing with semi-automatic handguns, semi-automatic rifles, and so on, far exceed 200,000 uh, Americans owning these things, 200,000 weapons, and, all, and so on and so on. So it's likely um, that... A short barrel rifle may very well also meet the common use test, but I think here's the critical point. So far in this video, I've demonstrated that the ATF is likely going to lose on the administrative. There's very powerful arguments on the administrative side, and on the Second Amendment, there's very strong arguments. So here's where I think this is going to wind up. Federal courts are going to recognize that there are powerful administrative arguments, and there's also powerful constitutional arguments. Now, there is a doctrine that I'm going to teach you right here, right now, called the constitutional avoidance doctrine. I repeat, the constitutional avoidance doctrine. The constitutional avoidance doctrine says that when a federal court or any court has an opportunity to, dis to, to dispose of a case, to resolve a case, without interpreting 
the Constitution, that court should dispose of the case using other laws and other arguments and other methodology that do not impact or do not require them to interpret the Constitution. Here, because the administrative arguments against the ATF are extremely powerful, as are the Second Amendment arguments, I think what's going to happen ultimately is these federal courts are going to look at this and say, look, under the constitutional avoidance doctrine, we can avoid getting into the nitty gritty of whether or not certain NFA items are constitutionally protected under the Second Amendment, whether or not NFA items can ever meet the common use test. We don't need to get into all these big debates about our short barrel rifles protected arms under the Second Amendment. We could avoid all of that. We federal courts can avoid the question of whether or not short barrel rifles are protected arms under the Second Amendment and other NFA items are protected items under the Second Amendment or not, simply by ruling against the ATF and the federal government on the administrative law side of the debate. Because if the courts rule in favor of the private individuals, of in favor of gun owners against the government, on administrative law challenges under the Administrative Procedure Act and the like, arguing that they lack the statutory authority, for example, courts can then avoid, they can constitutionally avoid, they can avoid the constitutional interpretation and the debate over the Second Amendment and the NFA, which I think they're going to want to do because it gets into some uh, natty little items and little controversies and debates. And therefore, I think that the Second Amendment and the strong arguments associated with the Second Amendment as applied to the pistol brace fight and the short barrel rifles is actually going to force the hands of the federal court to rule in favor of gun owners against the ATF, but do so based on the line of legal precedence and law associated with administrative law, the Administrative Procedural Act, and the fact that the ATF is acting outside of its statutory authority under both the National Firearms Act and arguably under the Gun Control Act of 1968 as well. And therefore, the Second Amendment will save the day although I don't think it will be the basis of the rulings in favor of America's gun owners and the Second Amendment. I think that that will happen a little bit differently, but the existence of the Second Amendment arguments will push the courts to rule favorably and in the right way dealing with the administrative law, but they will be able to skip the questions of the Second Amendment in this current controversy. That's how I think this is going to play out over time. Only time will tell. Uh, I can't predict the future. If I could, I'd be a billionaire on Wall Street. But, you know, I think that what I've just said is likely going to play out and uh, only time will tell. Okay, I hope you learned a little bit something here today. I know we got into some weeds here, uh, but I hope you learned something here at the Four Boxes Diner. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. We'll see you again soon. The Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.